battle with cancer and some of the things we've learned from the Lord during this time. And Heather's going to start, and I'm going to pray for her just before we get going, and then I'm going to come up and finish in a little bit. Father, we bless you and thank you for your great faithfulness, and we pray, Lord, that the words of Heather would be useful for your purposes, Lord. You said that when a man finds a wife, he finds a good thing, and I certainly have, have that, and I appreciate that, Lord. You've been gracious to me, and, uh, and Heather has been a wonderful comforter and help in the difficult times, and uh, as have you, Lord, and as has the people in the family of God. So we praise you and worship you tonight, today, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I found a good thing, too. <laughs> it's a, lot, a little louder than I thought. Um, and not only in my husband, but in my mother and father-in-law who are here today, um, I have been just very, very blessed to have such a wonderful family. So we're very grateful for the opportunity to share some of the things that we've learned through Dan's cancer journey. And unfortunately, cancer, um, having it, is not that unusual. Three out, or two out of five people, I'm sorry, will be diagnosed with cancer in their lifetime. Dan has non-small cell lung cancer, and lung cancer is the leading cancer killer in the United States in both men and women. It kills more people than the three most common cancers combined, breast, can uh, breast cancer, colon cancer, and prostate cancer. And half of all lung cancer cases are already stage four by the time that they're diagnosed. And that's why it's um, such a dangerous cancer because there are no symptoms. And for someone like Dan, who he didn't smoke, he didn't have any risk factors, it, it came as a huge surprise for us. Um, yet time and again, he's beaten the odds and survived. And this has given us a unique opportunity to learn from um, his journey. And the Lord has, has been, you know, who has taught us things throughout this time, and that's been a real blessing. One of the things we've learned is how important it is to have the support of friends and family, particularly close people who will pray for you during this time. Um, and, and this is for any time that you're facing a crisis. Their prayers are so essential, so it's important to foster relationships for your sake and the sake of others. The writer of Hebrews tells us to consider one another not or to consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see the day approaching. And this is something that did not come naturally for me. I was always a very private, introverted person. And at the time Dan was diagnosed, we hadn't been married long, and so I was very new to our family. I was a stay-at-home mom, and I didn't have many close relationships. So while Dan, being very social and, and um, very likable, was getting a lot of phone calls and emails, I got a total of two over the first couple of weeks that we were letting people know. And I felt really alone, and I realized what a mistake I had made not, um, not letting people into my heart. And so then one night, that all changed on November 2nd of 2012, when I uh, was getting ready for bed, and nights are the worst when you're going through a crisis. And we were waiting on some test results at that point in time because we wanted to find out exactly what, we knew he had cancer, but we didn't know what kind yet, and we didn't know how aggressive it was. And then I opened my laptop and I had a beautiful email waiting for me from my sister-in-law, Marion. And she wrote a very specific prayer, and it was as if God had planted all of the things in those words of that email that had been in my heart, stirring around and concerning me. And, and I knew that God moved her to write to me in a time of my greatest need, and that I wasn't alone. And she ended her email by saying, know that your family is deeply loved by God, by family, and by friends. Kevin, the girls, and I had a prayer, for, prayer meeting for, la, for you last night, for all of you. And that was so special. And since then, Marian's become my best friend. And she continues to send me encouraging emails. But this first one will always be my favorite. 
um, because it's, um, it, it's the one that taught me about this, this importance of reaching out to people, even though you may not know them very well. Because it's interesting to note at the time, she thought I had a lot of support. And she didn't realize what a difference her words would make. That's how it often is. We don't realize the significance of those small things that we can do for someone else. And, you know, to be honest, it can be very uncomfortable to reach out to someone that you don't know very well. You might even feel like you're bothering them. Um, you know, you think they're going through this thing and they don't really need me calling. I know I felt that way. But now I can tell you being on the receiving end of that, it never bothers you. And if it does, they'll tell you. <laughs> they'll say, you know, call me tomorrow or something. But um, it's a very special thing. So I tell this story to encourage you to reach out to the people um, in your life who are facing a crisis and maybe even people who you encounter who you don't know very well because it can make a big difference in what they're going through. Now something else that we've learned on this journey is how unpredictable life can be. I mentioned how surprised we were at Dan's diagnosis. Circumstances can change in an instant, sometimes for the worse, sometimes for better. And the Apostle James tells us in his epistle, now listen you who say, today or tomorrow, we'll go to this or that city, spend a year here, carry on business and make money. Why, you don't even know what's going to happen tomorrow. What is your life? You're a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. Instead, you ought to say, if it is the Lord's will, we will live and do this or that. If you look back over the journey of your lifetime, I'm certain that, like Dan and I, you'll see many detours. Some of them are wonderful, and some of them aren't. It was our third wedding anniversary when we learned that Dan had cancer. And within a week, we found out how serious that diagnosis was, that it had spread throughout his body. They told us that Dan had a life expectancy of six to nine months, probably closer to six at the rate that the cancer was spreading. And for the first time, we realized what James meant when he said that we are but a mist. It was the time of year when we would normally make our plans for the following summer, and we needed to make reservations and put down deposits for an annual trip to the cabin that all of the Ericsons take. And it really plagued on my mind that what if we weren't even going to be at the cabin? What if we were going to be planning a funeral instead? And it sounds um, grim, but it's not an exaggeration. More than half of the people with lung cancer die within the first year of their diagnosis. And for metastatic lung cancer, when cancer has spread to other organs, that five-year survival rate is only 4%. When Dan learned this, he said, well, someone has to be in the 4%. I'll volunteer. And thankfully, he is. Since then, his life has hung in the balance several times. And just as often, something has changed the direction that his health was headed. And it's a very good thing that he didn't throw in the towel or we would have missed out on some wonderful memories. During this time, our children have all grown five years older. He's seen our daughter Summer graduate high school, and this fall he will see our daughter Sam begin college. He now has twin grandsons in California that he gets to Skype with regularly, and they're absolutely adorable. We've taken many trips as a family, and he and I as a couple. Recently, he was told by his oncologist at the University of Minnesota that the treatment he was on was no longer helping him. She said that there were no more conventional treatments available and suggested that he go to the Mayo Clinic to seek something experimental. And this was terrifying, at least to me it was. The, the clinical trial oncologist at Mayo said it was a miracle that Dan was in as good a health as he is considering all that his body has gone through in terms of treatment. He advised him to take the summer off and enjoy life 
rebuild strength and return when the cancer begins to rear its ugly head again, and then they can try something experimental at that point. One thing that we've learned throughout this journey is that you can make plans, and you should, but be prepared that life will often take a detour. So how do you cope with this reality, this unpredictability of life? You have to trust in God. And when I say that, I don't say that in a, in a sort of flippant way, you know, like sometimes people will just say it, but they don't really think about it. You have to really grab a hold of him and trust in him. When we first told our children that Dan had cancer, they were very young. Emily was our youngest at eight years old, and Sam was 10, and Summer was 14, and each had their own unique way of reacting to the news and dealing with the reality of having a parent with cancer. It was Sam's reaction that surprised me the most, because she said, don't worry, God will take care of us. And as a Christian, I should have had that same reaction, but I will confess to you, I didn't. I wondered if she didn't fully comprehend the gravity of what we were telling them. But as time went on and she learned more and more about what was happening, um, her response never changed. She seemed to have either unshakable faith or enormous naivete. It became clear as she grew older that she was fully aware of Dan's prognosis, medically speaking, um, that it was not good. Still, I wondered how she rec re reconciled the knowledge that her, with, of her strong conviction with that knowledge that, um, that Dan was so sick, along with the faith, and, and made them match up. So recently I asked her about it, and she said, well, I've always known that dad could die, but I also know that God will take care of us. And even if that happens. So faith in God and an understanding of the reality that you're facing, does, they don't need to be incompatible. Beyond this life is something even more important that we as Christians hope for, and that is our eternal hope. The Apostle Paul writes to the Corinthians, if we have put our hope in Christ for this life only, we should be pitied more than anyone. We must know that in the span of eternity, the time that we have here on earth is but a blink of an eye. So whatever difficulty we may be called to endure, we can take comfort in the fact that eternity awaits us. After so many ups and downs of facing cancer, you would think we would get used to bad news. But the truth is, you never do. You're like a boxer in the ring, and you know the blow is going to come, but it still hurts. And when we get a scan result telling us that Dan's cancer is progressing, we feel those fears. Facing life without him, never again holding his hand, or hearing his voice say just the right thing when we need it most. But then... I imagine one day that Dan will be standing before Jesus and he'll be in the presence of his heart's greatest love and all of his pain and suffering will be a thing of the past. And on that day, no matter how much pain I'm feeling, I can be grateful for him. And that is the hope that we have. I thank you very much for being here today and sharing um, in our story, and I look forward to hearing what Dan has to say. <laughs> thank you. I am a blessed man. Over the last um, five and a half years, I haven't felt well a good part of the time. Want to switch over? Okay. Sorry about that. Um, but the Lord has been gracious to me, and I have been writing a little bit. And we have some books here, 
after this service. If you have any interest in them, we'll sign them. ABCs of the Bible, 200 two-minute lessons on the essentials of the faith. I wrote that a couple years ago. It's on Amazon and all that stuff, but we have them here today, hard copy. And then uh, just this past December, praying the Psalms. Um, one of my favorite things to do in prayer is pray the Psalms, and it's become a, a real exciting addition to my prayer life, and I share some of my methods of praying the Psalms in that book. Heather wrote a book, and it's selling well all over the world, actually, Facing Cancer as a Friend. A response has been really good, and it's really, really a great book with the what to do and what not to do with people that are uh, in uh, crisis mode, what to say, what not to say. It's just a wonderful book. Heather also wrote, and we've got a couple different colors, it's the same book, The Memory Maker's Journal. And it's about 200 pages, or 300 maybe, of questions like, have you taken up any late in life hobbies? Questions about school as a child? Questions about faith and family? Anyway, um, I, I, and I'm, I'm doing this right, I'm, I'm filling one of these out right now. The, the um, thing I wish about a lot of the people that have died already in my life. I wish I knew more about them. And this is hundreds of, several hundred pages of questions to, to, to cause a person to think and then write down the answer, and it just about covers everything in life, and it's a pretty cool book. Uh, Heather's third book is just about out. We don't have it here today, but it's Facing Cancer as a Parent, and it's all about how to do that. And so, so much for our intermission. It's a blessing being here today with the family of God, and it's fun to see some uh, familiar faces uh, and several familiar faces here today from uh, several decades. Uh, it's a uh, joy to be here and a joy to see you folks. As uh, you know, we've been facing this cancer battle, and uh, one of the things uh, I've learned through, I, I'm going I'm to kind of enumerate three things I'm, I've learned during this t um, last uh, five and a half years, and um, one of the things I've learned is that we learn things that, uh, during a trial that we wouldn't have learned if we didn't go through the trial. If things always go good, there's just a certain part of life and lessons that we miss out on. So a trial in a difficult time can be our friend. And we have the opportunity when we go through difficult times to become a person that we wouldn't have become if we didn't go through that trial. So lessons to be learned. Heather and I uh, would rather have remained ignorant of a lot of, the, of, a lot of these things uh, that we've gone through. Uh, we've become an expert in all kinds of things that we wish we never knew about, and we've learned all kinds of interesting um, Latin words and words that are hard to pronounce, and, and uh, my body has felt all kinds of funny things that uh, I'd rather would not have felt, but I don't know if I would have traded this experience uh, for the lessons I've learned and my closeness to my Heavenly Father. Someone once said, don't waste a good trial. John Piper, we know John Piper, um, wrote a little booklet called Don't Waste Your Cancer. Trials stink, but there's a silver lining in most trials and there's things to be learned and, uh, and a life to be changed. Difficulties in life happen. And it's no big surprise that the scriptures are not silent about difficulties, difficulties in life. There's uh, um, numerous verses that talk directly about trials, although maybe not quite the way we would expect it to. And I'm thinking about a couple of them in James chapter 1, verse 2 and 4, verse 2 through 4. Count it all joy, brethren, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. I, yeah, I guess that wouldn't be the first thing that I would think of when something bad happens to me. It's counted all joy. But there's a reason, as we just read here, there's a reason God says to count it all joy, and it's because the testing of your faith develops perseverance. It helps you become a better person. Romans 3 through 5 kind of says the same thing. Rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance. Endurance produces character, and character produces hope. Again, we have the opportunity to become a better person than we would have become if we weren't going through that trial. So 
in an effort to be a bit of a good student um, uh, during my difficulties, I've, I've learned three things, a number of things, but I'm just going to enumerate three things briefly that I've learned that have been real helpful, and things that you wouldn't have to go through a trial to learn, maybe you can learn from someone else. We've all gone through difficult times. We all know people who are going through difficult times, and we can learn from them, but we can learn these things without going through the trial, too. And the first one is servanthood. Psalm 46, 1 says, God is an ever-present help in the time of trouble. And I found him to be that faithful, ever-present help in the time of trouble. But sometimes God is our ever-present help uh, through his people, through the family of God. Uh, we've heard uh, over and over, I don't think it's in the Bible, but we've heard it over and over that we are his hands and his feet. And that just really is uh, largely true. Um, I haven't always been the best uh, I've been a believer all my life, but I haven't been, always been the best um, person when somebody else in my life has had a difficult time. You know, I'd pray for them, I'd feel bad for them or whatever, but I really wouldn't inconvenience myself significantly to get up and go put my hands on the situation and help. And so um, when five and a half years ago I was diagnosed and all of a sudden people are coming out of the woodwork to do that very thing and come and serve and bless me, I learned quite a lesson. And... Um, I learned it thoroughly, to the point where oftentimes I keep my radar open. I enjoy doing that, to go visit somebody in the hospital or go pray with somebody or something like that. I've learned a lesson and uh, have become probably a better help to people as a result of learning that lesson through God's people who have been, ble who have been blessing me for these last several years. 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 4, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies, the God of all comfort, who comforts us in our affliction so we can comfort others in their affliction. And I found that to be a great blessing and a privilege to learn to help others. Servanthood uh, means denying ourselves. It means being uh, willing to do a few inconvenient things. Um, part of servanthood, uh, servanthood is part of being a disciple of Christ. Jesus talked about servanthood quite a bit. I remember the song, if you want to be great in God's kingdom, learn to be a servant of all. Matthew 25, Jesus speaking on Judgment Day. He's dividing the sheep from the goats and the people who did a good job on earth and the people who did not. And he says to the sheep, he says, Blessed are you by my Father, for I was hungry, you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me drink. I was a stranger, you welcomed me in. I was naked and you clothed me. And the sheep didn't quite understand what he was talking about. When did we see you naked and clothe you? When did we feed you? When did we give you something to drink? And he says, when you've done it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. And that's all about servanthood. God has a soft heart towards people in trouble. And um, I found it to be a great privilege to be on the receiving end, but also a great privilege to start being on the end of helping people in the time of need. Second thing I've learned is seeking first the kingdom of God, kind of managing, uh, managing the busyness of life. Matthew 6, 33, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, seek first the kingdom of God. And I kind of like to add on to it, and everything else is a distant second. Because we're Americans, we're busy, right? Land of opportunity, hard to say no, lots of good stuff to be involved in but most of us probably would have to admit to maybe even being too busy, right? Someone once said, if we're too busy for God and we're too busy for others, we're too busy. And that makes sense? And we can find ourselves busy in this life, in this wonderful American life, but we can find ourselves busy with lots of good things, but too many good things sometimes can turn into a bad thing. I was talking to my discipleship group yesterday morning, uh, and we were talking about doing some review of, of, the, of the, the weeks of discipleship that we've been going through. And one of the emphasis in the group, probably the large, biggest emphasis is daily, spending daily time with God. And some, a couple of the guys were speaking up and they said, you know, I just have not been able to do that for a while now. I, I, life is busy, I'm busy working, and I'm doing other things, and I don't get home until nine o'clock at night. And, and um, and, and I just don't, I don't, I get tired. I don't have any time for God after that. It's a good example of just being too busy for God and misplaced priorities. Who in their life approved their schedule? They did. 
And so they let their uh, life get too, bu- too full and too busy for God. If it's too busy in our life, or if our life is too busy, we are not able to spend time with God or not able to take a break and go help somebody else in need, then we're too busy and something's got to go. And that something isn't God, is it? Something in our schedule has to go. You know, sometimes we have seasons of busyness that just have to happen. But uh, I have rubbed, been myself the person and rubbed shoulders with other people for decades that can go decade after decade of being too busy and not uh, and end up spiritually a, a mile wide and an inch deep with no depth in our lives. It takes a conscious effort to keep this from happening. In Mark chapter 4, we read about the parable of the sower. And um, we won't go into all of it, but uh, the sower went out to sow and he, he planted some seed along, um, along the road and on some rocky places and along, among some thorns and then uh, in, uh, in good ground. And Jesus went and interpreted this, and he said, the, the seed is the word of God, and it's sowed in these various places, and particularly amongst the thorns, I wanted to just comment on. It says, uh, among the thorns, um, those, they are those who hear the word, but the cares of this world, the deceitfulness of riches, the desires for other things enter in and choke the word. And so as we read about this, you know, some of this stuff is not good. Deceitfulness of riches, the desires for too many things, covetousness, but the cares of this world aren't necessarily bad things. They're things that have to happen in our lives. They're, they're just life things. We have to eat. We have to have a shelter. We, we do things with our kids and all that kind of stuff, grandkids, whatever. But too many of these things choke the word and make it unfruitful. And it's, uh, I would assume everybody here wants a life that is pleasing to God, wants to know God better now, or better, better, better next year than, they do now, than we do now and uh, want to be pleasing in his sight and want to hear well done because we really do, did do it well. And a big part of that is spending time and getting to know God and getting to know his word and being close to him. And if our life is too busy, it's just not going to happen. And so what I've learned um, during five and a half years basically of being sick a good part of the time and having very little energy, and I've had to really make some priority choices but the priority choices, first of all, had to be seek first the kingdom of God. And then whatever else I could do, I wanted to make sure that God didn't get the leftovers. He got the first fruits, kind of like tithing. When we uh, read the Bible about tithing, it always says that we're supposed to give the first fruits of the income. And why is that? It so gets done. Because if we don't give the first fruits, what happens? We pay the payments, we buy a few things, and whoops, there's not enough money for God. He gets the leftovers. Well, it's the same in life. Consciously saying yes to things in our life in light of whether or not we really do have time and not kick God out of our schedule is, uh, is the way we need to look at it. The last thing I want to mention is an eternal perspective. There's, um, whenever I sign um, my book on ABCs of the Bible, I include this verse in Colossians 3, 1 through 2. If you then have been raised with Christ... Seek those things that are above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind, or some translations say affections, on things above, not on things of the earth. I've learned through this difficult time to have an eternal perspective, and Heather was commenting on that too, the eternal perspective of looking at everything in light of eternity. Throughout the Bible, we're called pilgrims and strangers and aliens and and like Heather was mentioning, we uh, were in, in the book of James chapter 4 where, t- where our life is uh, likened to a, 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 a vapor or a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Of course, the underlying message there is it's short. And how we live here in this life determines how things are going to go in the next life. If you would imagine with me, just it's kind of a funny thing here, but if you imagine with me an extension cord, uh, let's make it an orange extension cord. We can probably all imagine that pretty well. And it's a real, real long extension cord. In fact, it doesn't even end. And on the one end of the extension cord, we've got that little black plug, don't we? Most extension cords have a plug at the end, and then orange ones sometimes have a little black plug, and it's about that long. And if you would imagine for, with me that that little area, that little black part is this life. And that orange part is eternity. 
And what we do in this little black time determines how eternity will look. We all get to heaven the same way through the blood of Jesus, through a sacrifice for our sins. But the rewards and the things that God has us responsible for in the next life are determined by what happens in this life and how we live this life. Matthew 6, chapter, uh, verse 20, talks about laying up our treasures in heaven. And I like to think about an eternal perspective and, and, and laying up our treasures and living our life now with an eternity in mind, kind of like retirement. We get a check from the boss and we can do whatever we want with that income, but some people uh, wisely set a certain part aside into a retirement account and defer the use of it till later. They've got the freedom now to spend that money if they want, they can spend it on a vacation or buy a car or whatever, but they defer to later, set it aside for later, and then when later comes, there it is. And that's kind of what we can do in our life when we have an eternal perspective. There's an account in the next life that God is keeping of our life and our treasures and our energy and our time and what we've done with these things. And when we do them, uh, use the, do these things um, with an eternal purpose in mind and it makes an eternal difference in, in people's lives, there's an account being kept, a ledger being kept about these things, you might say. And when we get to the next life, everything we've laid aside for our eternal retirement uh, is sitting there waiting for us. Whereas if we just spend our life and our energies and our money just on ourselves and ourselves in this life, um, uh, the account's going to be kind of skinny in heaven. I'd like you to just uh, th think with me a little bit. You know, I, I've, I, through the years, I found it helpful to reevaluate my spiritual life. I want, if I could graph my spiritual life, I want to keep going up and getting better, not plateau and not go down. And um, uh, I've done that throughout my whole life and many times have had, have, have, have had to change things. Um, we all probably, if we want to admit it, um, need a personal revival one time, once in a while. And sometimes we have a pivotal experience in our life it's, you know, way past conversion where things change and get better again and, and we've rededicated our life to the Lord and we've changed some priorities and stuff like that. So I'd act, like to ask you all if you just bow your head and close your eyes as we close here and um, think a little bit about um, life and what life's looking like right now in your life, your spiritual life, your priorities, uh, kingdom purposes. Uh, are we laying up treasures in heaven with our time and our strength and our finances? Are we sending on ahead or are we consuming it now? Am I building my kingdom or the God kingdom of God? Am I affecting anyone's life for eternity? Has my spiritual life improved or is it just staying the same or is it going down? Could it be said of me that I'm a disciple of Christ instead of just a Christian? Like I said, lots of us need to come to a place where we admit a little bit of lukewarmness and we need to have a spiritual revival. And so um, I would like to just sit here for a couple minutes and ask the Spirit of God to speak to us and see if there's anything in our lives that uh, needs some tweaking spiritually. And then I'll close in prayer. Father, it is a blessing to be called a believer, a son of the Most High, and to have an eternal uh, 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 inheritance uh, that you say will never spoil or fade away. It's been an incredible privilege, Lord, to be adopted into the family of God. And whatever um, opportunities we have in life to be able to dedicate those opportunities to eternal purposes, we thank you, Lord, for their strength to do the work of God, we thank you, Lord, for the conviction and the desire to do the work of God. We ask you, Lord, to keep us uh, in mind, keep, keep in our minds the, the, the purposes that we have in this life and the privilege of serving our great God and how life can go by year after year, month after month, or, or decade after decade. And uh, sometimes it just gets away from us, Lord, and we don't do and uh, don't become the person you'd have us be. So we just pray, Father, to remind us 
and point to some things in our lives that need some revival. And uh, we thank you, Lord, that you are God who, who rejuvenates us, Lord, and restores to us the joy of our salvation and, and gives us new excitement in our life. And, and uh, we just pray for that, Lord, for everybody here. If there's anybody here, Lord, that's, that's, um, that's um, just not where they want to be spiritually or where you want them to be spiritually, we ask, Lord, that you would revive them and cause them to be useful to you. In Jesus' name, amen.